Hi and welcome to Airway Management 2. Um, this is obviously the second series in a video, uh, second video in a series on airway management for EMTs. Um, we're going to just jump into it. This shouldn't be too long of a video, and uh, we've already covered so much in Airway Management 1 uh, that you're really going to need uh, before this video um, is probably helpful to you. So I suggest you watch Airway Management 1 first and then jump back into this when you've gotten through that. Um, okay, <clears throat> so quick disclaimer, I am not an EMT instructor or clinician. Anything that's presented to you in this uh, video, it's up to you and solely up to you to make sure that you ultimately um, confirm that the information is accurate and factual. You should always refer back to your textbook, your instructors, your state protocol, your medical director, and um, any other or um, personnel or information that um, defines your standard of care and scope of practice. So with that disclaimer out of the way, <clears throat> let's um, jump into um, this uh, presentation. We've covered some of this stuff in the Airway 1, so we're going to just jump forward. Uh, in Airway Management 1, we covered the respiratory foundation, respiratory anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. All of those things are going to continue to be important for you to understand in this um, next section. Now in this section, we're going to talk about performing a patient assessment specifically for respiratory patients. Um, airway management, some, we're going to go over briefly some of the devices that are used to help you get a little more familiar with those. Uh, and then we're going to talk about patient management, some things you need to know about in dealing with the patient themselves. Again, all of this has to do with airway management. So these things will change depending on the type of condition you face in the field. <clears throat> Again, as I've stated, um, the idea here is to focus on the academics. If there are things that come up during your training that require you to learn skills, you need to do that with your instructors. Uh, also, it's important that you understand this is a supplemental program to your textbooks and your in-class training. So you cannot just watch this and assume or expect that you're going to get through either class quizzes or the final exam or your national registry exam for your EMTB program. You need to put in the time and the energy and the effort. The goal here is to help make it a lot easier for you by putting things into a logical um, um, series right, of information that can help you build on it and then hopefully when you are studying your text and attending class, you have a much better understanding of the material. So again, as I mentioned in Airway Management 1, not everything here is going to be in the same order you may have it presented in your text or in your classroom. Uh, I'm presenting this in the way I think makes the most sense, at least to me, and allows me to kind of get my head around these concepts. So all of that is to kind of, again, make sure that before you do this, you are very comfortable and truly understand the information in the Airway One, uh, Airway Management One video that uh, is part of this series. So, with all of that out of the way, let's start talking about patient assessment. <clears throat> so, at this point, we should have a good understanding of a patient's anatomy uh, related to the um, upper and lower airway. We should understand the physiology behind how um, ventilation oxygenation and respiration work and what those terms mean. Uh, we should understand how all that occurs both at the organism level and all the way down into the chemical processes and um, how the cells interact with those chemical processes which ultimately impacts uh, tissues which impact the organs and the organ systems. So from here we're kind of jumping into the situation where we now have to deal with a patient and apply that knowledge. So we're going to do some fun stuff as we go through this. Some of you probably are not old enough to remember. I've never seen an episode of the TV show Emergency, but if not, you should go check it out. You can find this. I think there's some of it on YouTube and definitely on Hulu. Um, but Emergency is really the foundation of what got so many of us into this line of uh, this profession. Um, it was on pretty much every Saturday night, and people all over the country would gather on the couch and kind of just watch the hour-long episode. And it was really cool because it, it showcased, truly showcased, um, the work of paramedics and firefighters in Los Angeles County. 
Uh, it wasn't a reality show. It was really, really done well. So the um, show centered around uh, Station 51 and Squad 51, which you can see here in the photo. This little Dodge truck, um, which was the um, paramedic unit that would respond as the first response. Uh, now, this is going back into the late 70s and 80s, so uh, it's pretty interesting how far back our legacy goes. <clears throat> so in any case, you've been dispatched to an unknown medical emergency across the street from the Paramount Sausage Company. Uh, upon arrival, what's our first concern? What's the first thing we're thinking about as soon as we're rolling up, as we're you know, within <clears throat> a few hundred feet of the scene, a you know, hundred yards of the scene, what are we looking for? What are we trying to determine? It's a very important thing. And once we arrive at the scene and we've determined what that first thing is, what are we trying to figure out regarding the patient's location and environment? Like obviously, where is the patient? But what are we doing as we're trying to get to where the patient is? Um, also, in Airway Management 1, we talked about what is the most important objective and goal we have as an EMS provider, right? Not to allow anything that's a life-threatening issue impact our patient um, is, is the goal, right? As well as returning the patient's body to a homeostasis state if possible. So given all this, <clears throat> as you're approaching this patient and your knowledge of VOR, which right is ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration, what are you thinking about? You have an unknown medical emergency, where right? you really don't know what's wrong with this patient. But we do know that the most important thing we can do and the most important thing we have to establish is the patient's ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration, how well that's happening. Because if that's occurring well, then we can be pretty certain, pretty sure, that we're, we're okay. The patient's not in a life-threatening situation. But we also need to understand the scene and the environment and patient location because even if the patient's doing well right now the scene the location and the environment could give us clues to what this unknown medical emergency is so we're just kind of laying some light <clears throat> foundation here so that you start employing the skills that you learned in airway management one related to anatomy physiology and pathophysiology okay and and then translate that to a practical application Okay, so we're going to continue doing that. But for right now, the, the thing that we're concerned most of when we're arriving on the scene or about 100 yards away is scene safety, right? Is the scene safe? Do we have any conditions, you know, ice, water, uneven roadway, potholes, something I could twist my ankle on? We always talk about down wires. Those are pretty obvious. I mean, the wires themselves sometimes aren't obvious, but that's a pretty stock answer. What we don't think about is we pull our vehicle in an unreadable road surface. We don't realize there's a pothole. We get out, we stumble, we injure our knee, twist our ankle, and we're not able now to provide patient care. You know, something little like that is considered scene safety. It's nighttime, we're rushing to get to the patient. We don't realize <clears throat> that we have to go up a gravel driveway. Somebody was working on a car earlier in the day. Oil spilled, we hit the oil patch, the gravel gives way, we fall and injure our backs because we weren't using a flashlight. Well, we didn't use our scene lights. So scene safety <clears throat> is much more than just down power wires. We have to be able to get to that patient. But the other thing about scenes and the scene being safe is the environment. And especially when we're thinking about this from an airway perspective, right? We, we typically wanna make sure, do we have a patent airway? Do we have a patient that's breathing and oxygenating and, and respirating? Do we have perfusion? Do we have a good amount of perfusion in this patient? And one of the earliest things we can try to figure out and start ruling out is the environment the patient's in, right? So <clears throat> first thing, we're going we're to jump down to this patient surroundings, and we'll come back up to these uh, aerosol-generating procedures in a moment. But the patient surroundings, right, do we see any medications around? Do we see nebulizers or endotracheal tubes? Um, do we see any CPAP devices that the patient's using as we enter their environment? Um, is there drug paraphernalia? Are there fluids, vomit, blood, saliva, <clears throat> um, clear fluids, things? Uh, are there liquor, alcohol around? Um, is there gasoline in the area? <clears throat> you know, are there any scents? Do we send, smell gas? Do we um, not smell something, but yet we have a patient with an issue regarding their level of consciousness and they're feeling nauseous? 
So the environment is a big indicator of what we're dealing with here and can help us really ascertain very quickly, do we have a situation where the patient's um, airway may be compromised, the entire airway respiratory system? And it can also give us clues as to what actions we need to take. Do we need to evacuate this patient immediately? Can we do it um, in a more methodical process? Um, is it a clue as to why the patient may be experiencing the issue they're experiencing with? The other thing is bystander details. Obviously, bystanders can help us better understand what occurred before we were there and possibly some of the history of the patient. Um, and then ultimately, where is this location? Right? Are we talking about an industrial area? Are we on a ship, on a plane, side of a road, you know, backseat of a car? This can all help us understand the onset. <clears throat> Did this occur over time? I was on a cruise, I got sick, and I'm feeling worse and worse each day, and now I'm having trouble breathing. Well, that occurred over a period of time. You know, do, are we dealing with a viral situation, right? If we are, you know, do we need to be concerned of aerosol generating procedures, right? Um, because if we're doing things like CPR or nebulizer treatments or endotracheal intubation or providing CPAP or the patient's using a CPAP, um, those things are going to put aerosols into the environment, right? And, and those aerosols are going to transmit potentially contam uh, contagions, pathogens that could impact us as the rescuers. We're back to, is the scene safe? And a lot of this is from observing the environment. Um, another thing, you know, when we talk about location <clears throat> is, you know, if we're in the backseat of a car, this is probably a very fast onset. You know, uh, I was driving, I got really, really, my head hurt. I started having nausea and I started feeling as if I couldn't catch my breath. I decided to lay down in the back seat. I started feeling even more sick and called 911. So all of these things, if you really want to be a professional EMT, these are the kind of things you're thinking about, right? Is slowing it down and thinking about the scene and the environment we're in. Okay, so that's going to be important for you and it could play into your test questions, right? So think about what the test question is asking you. What's the scene? What's the environment? Are there any clues there? And obviously in real world, this is absolutely critical for you to be successful in caring for that patient. So <clears throat> we've been talking about airway management and now we have a patient. Um, one clue is if a patient is breathing normally, you should not be able to see or hear them breathing. Now, this isn't always true, right, because there could be environmental factors like noise or maybe the patient's not facing you. But what we're trying to say here is if the patient is just sitting like you are right now, and chances somebody glanced at you from two or three feet away, they're not going to see your chest expanding and not. They're not going to see your shoulders rising up and down. They're not going to see um, air coming, moving in and out of your mouth. They're not going to hear you gasping for air or, or breathing heavy. So it typically... Typically, we're not going to hear or see anything, but there are chances and there are situations where you may not hear or see somebody's breathing and it still may not be considered um, adequate. But as a baseline, typically, for adequate breathing, and this is probably going to be on your test, normal breathing in most adults is going to be 12 to 20 breaths per minute. They're going to have a regular pattern of inhalation and exhalation. And you should understand how that occurs, what the diaphragm's job in this is, what negative pressure means. All of those things are in the last video. But they should have a normal, regular pattern. They should breathe in and then breathe out. And it should be consistent. Same depth, same pattern. If you listen to their lungs, they should be clear and equal, meaning both the song, lung sounds on both sides are the same. And you shouldn't be hearing any wheezing, rasping, rattling, or anything else. It should be just a nice, clean exchange of air. If you look at their chest, if you are able to observe the chest, you're going to note that the, both sides of their chest rise and fall in unison, together, right? Unilaterally. <clears throat> and then depth, right? This is tidal volume. If you don't know what tidal volume is, you need to go back to the last video. <clears throat> but you should be able to see that they're the tidal volume is appropriate for the situation they're in and that they're not in any form of distress or struggling in any way, shape, or form to get air in and out of their system. Now, I want to ask you something. If all of this is occurring, if we have all of this happening, does it mean that this patient 
in regard to airway breathing and circulation is still okay. Could you have a respiratory situation even if all of this is green? You, you got breaths between 12 and 20, regular pattern of inhalation, exhalation, bilateral clear and equal lung sounds, regular equal chest rise and fall, and apparently adequate depth of breathing, you know, good tidal volume. Could you still have an issue? Now, what I want you to do is not just blurt out an answer. I want you to step back and think about it. We talked a lot about ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration in the last video. And we talked about just because you have ventilation doesn't mean you could you have adequate what? So what other things could be happening under the covers that this still could be considered an airway issue? Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is because you can have a patient that you are dealing with who is completely fine or appears completely fine and then little clues start to happen as you're dealing with this patient that suddenly you didn't have an airway management issue and one develops. So I just want you to know just because this stuff is good doesn't mean it won't become bad very quickly. So here are this little table. Um, you need to know this right, for your work in the field and for your quiz and test. So an adult is 12 to 20. A child is 12 to 40, be it breaths per minute, and an infant is 30 to 60. Now, how do I remember this? I know that adult and children, the lower end is always 12, so I don't have to think much. So I always say to myself, 12, 20, 40, 30, 60, right? So 12 to 20 is my adult, 12 to 40 is my child, 30 to 60 is my infant. So I just say 12, 20, 40, 30, 60. Okay, hopefully that'll help you play around with things that are going to help you remember it, but I can guarantee that's probably going to be either a skills check, you're going to come up to a situation in your, t in your exam <clears throat> where you need to evaluate a patient, you're being told it's an infant, and the infant's respirations are 44. You need to know 30 to 60, okay? Or you may have this in a quiz, definitely in your, your final exam and your national registry exam. So what is in abnormal breathing? Right? Abnormal breathing is obviously the opposite of adequate or normal breathing. So in this case, we're either going to have less than or more than 12 breaths per minute. So less than would be Brady, and then there's another word, which I'm going to let you figure out, and tacky is going to be greater than uh, 20. <clears throat> so we need to know, as the EMT, what is the rate of respiration, right? We need to know how much, how many times a minute is this person breathing. Um, irregular ventilation rhythm. What is their pattern? How many, how, you know, are they matching their inhalation and their exhalation? Or is it, you know, very fast and then no inhalation, exhalation, and then it sporadic? Like what, what is their pattern of ventilation? Okay. That's what we mean by ventilation rhythm. So you need to ask, what's this person's pattern? You need to see that. <clears throat> What do you hear? You know, are you hearing anything coming in and out of the nasal and oral cavities? Or are you using a stethoscope and, and listening to their lungs and hearing something there? Is there something going on with the amount of air coming in and out of their nose, right? Coming out of their nose. What's going on with the tidal volume, which you should know at this point? And is there an issue with residual volume, right? Meaning, are we leaving too much air in the lungs? Again, these things are defined in your last video but now you're applying them. That's why we spent so much time building that foundation. You know, is there inadequate chest expansion, right? Can they not expand their chest? You know, so what are the components of chest expansion? Well, the thoracic cage and the diaphragm are, are involved there. We have something going on with the phrenic nerve. Where's the phrenic nerve live? The cervical. So if it's in the cervical, do we have potential spine injury? Do we not? Nope, we're good there, maybe. Do we have something else going? Do we have some kind of muscular issue, right? So these are the things that we're trying to figure out as we assess this patient for abnormal breathing. It's not just, hey, they're not breathing well, and so we're done, right? It's There's a bigger picture here. You know, are they working to breathe? What's their body position? Are they fighting to get breath in? You know, what is the tidal volume, right? Is it a shallow depth? Are they not breathing fully? What's going on with their skin and why is it happening? The color of their skin can give you clues based on the environment and other things as to what is occurring. They can also give you clues as to how far along they are in their distress, right? We'll talk about that in a moment. 
if you can see the patient's rib area and their clavicles, right, when they breathe in, when they inspire or inhale, you know, <coughs> is it getting pulled? Do we have a lot of tightness there, right? And if so, that's going to indicate that you may have a much more serious situation on your hands. Um, so all of these things definitely need to know them, right? Um, what I've tried to do is give you some questions that relate this stuff back to an actual patient assessment. But these are the ways that we assess our patient, right? We're looking at breath rate. We're looking at ventilation patterns and rhythms. We're looking at for sounds. We're looking at their effort in breathing. We're looking for what their anatomy is doing. That's kind of it, right? So breath rate, ventilation pattern, sounds, <clears throat> their, their effort and or their, their depth, and their anatomy. What's their anatomy doing? Are their skin and ribs and diaphragm and thoracic cage working correctly? Okay, so you need to know this. Take some time to make sure you know this. This is tripoding. I'm probably familiar with it. Most people think about it when people are sitting, but you can do this standing. And probably many of us have done this. You can think back to your high school or college days, and maybe you still run today. And if you sprint and exert yourself, what do you do at the end of that? You bend over and you try to breathe, okay? Now, understanding why tripoding works and the impact on the diaphragm and how it opens up the airways is important for you to understand, but you need to recognize tripoding and know that if somebody is doing this, they're obviously having, they're working, they're, they're creating effort to breathe, and we now have to start thinking about all those questions, breath rate, you know, how much air are they getting in and out, what's going on with their ventilation, oxygenation, respirations, right? Okay. There are some special conditions when it comes to assessing our patients, some special things we want to think about. One is called agonal gasps. Now, the big thing here is, and you may have heard this in your CPR classes, or your BLS class, is that ultimately what an agonal gasp is, is the brain is still telling the respiratory system to attempt to ventilate and get oxygen in the system. It doesn't yet realize that things have gone kaput eventually a gonal gas will stop. Why? Because the brain is now not able to function and you've lost oxygen to the brain. So this is residual oxygen in the brain that's continuing to tell that system because of the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, receptors in a, the, the receptors are signaling that we have an issue. And all of this, again, you should know from your first class. You should be able to explain exactly the pathology and physiology behind why gonal gas are working. It's pretty straightforward. You already know all this. But basically, this is going to stop. <clears throat> now, the thing you need to keep in mind when you hear this agonal gasps, there's a very good chance you're not going to have a pulse. So in a patient that's unconscious, unresponsive, the reason we get to the pulse right away is because you could still see attempts to ventilate, attempts for the ventilation system to be working, for them trying to be breathing. And it's just their brain doesn't know that the heart is stopped. So the moment you see that there is no pulse, you need to begin compressions. And early compressions is part of the survival chain as part of CPR. So a gonal gasp, really serious situation. Again, if you're seeing, hearing this, and the patient's not responsive and unconscious, obviously, you should check for a pulse, carotid, and make sure that they have a pulse. If they do have a pulse, you may need to continue monitoring for a pulse, and you're going to need to assist ventilations. Something known as chine stokes. Now, this is, again, when the patient assessment we talked about <coughs> their ventilation rhythm, their pattern. So this is a pattern of breathing, Chine Stokes. That's all it is. And it's basically a pattern where the person is going to breathe quickly and deeply. So they're going to go very fast breaths, and each one is going to get a little deeper and deeper and deeper, and then less deep, less deep, less deep, and then they're not going to be breathing. And then they're going to breathe again <coughs> in the same pattern, right? They're going to go fast, 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 deep, 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 less deep, less deep, less deep, slower, 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 and then no breathing, or what we call apnea. This is a lot of times the outcome of a stroke or head injury. The patient is and could be conscious, and they may not realize they're doing this. You're going to observe this pattern. You're going to come on the scene, and you're going to observe this. And when you're trying to get their respiratory rate, you're going to realize there's a gap, right? You're counting like one breath, two breaths, three breaths, four, wait, no breaths. Then you're going to hear it start up again that's when you should be triggered on this is a chine stokes pattern and you need to move pretty quickly <clears throat> here's a graphic of it right so what we have here is we have apnea right the lack of breathing the lack of ventilation 
we've got a beginning of fast, 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 and deeper, 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 less deep, less deep, and then back to apnea, all right? <clears throat> and then it repeats. And you can see down here, and you should know this all now, is as this is occurring, obviously we're going to have challenges with respiration, right? And we're going to impact the cells, and we're going to have a problem with the exchange of gases, which is what carbon dioxide and oxygen at a cellular level, and obviously within the alveolia, uh, alveoli. Okay, <clears throat> so that's Chine Stokes. Another three pattern or three, two patterns, and one other thing you need to know: ataxic respirations. These are just crazy irregular breathing pattern, right? Chine Stokes has that pattern of you know fast and deep, less deep, less fast, and then apnea, and then it repeats that. With ataxic respirations, you don't have a pattern, right? You just, the person may take two or three breaths and then two or three deep breaths and then one breath and then stop and then take another breath and then take a holder breath. It's a crazy pattern. You have an ataxic situation. This may be because of a head injury. Now, why do you want to know this? Because if you see these things, like if you see Chine Stokes, you should be thinking, do I have a stroke patient here? Did I just not realize I have a stroke patient? Could be a head injury. Did this person fall? What's the environment and the scene telling me? Right? What are the bystanders telling me? What's around? If I have <clears throat> ataxic respirations, not a regular pattern, I need to figure out, did I miss a head injury? Okay. A good way to think, well, let's do Cosmol respirations and then we'll come back. Cosmol is deep, rapid respirations like Chine Stokes, but there is no apnea, meaning there is no stop in the breathing pattern. There's no pause. So you're going to just have deep, rapid, but consistent. Atax is inconsistent, irregular, crazy. Cosmol, not, right? It's going to be consistent, deep, rapid respiration. A lot of, right? In and out, very deep. This is a common situation when you have metabolic acidosis in the patient. So you could see this after a lot of exertion, uh, potentially after athletic events, um, but you could also see it because there's something happening in the body that's not allowing meta uh, the metabolism to work correctly. Now, you should know at this point where metabolism truly occurs at what level in the body and the two types of metabolism right? And what that means. Ultimately, all this tells us is, hey, we're about to have a pretty serious respiratory emergency. This patient is, is in respiratory distress for any of these, ataxic, chine stokes, cusmol. But I want you to take away the beauty of we're just looking at a pattern and we're able in our mind, if you really did well in air management one, to really start understanding what's happening inside this person's body and why you need to take action. Good way to remember this, if you don't have a normal and regular breathing pattern, right, you have either some form of head injury, a possible stroke, or a possible issue with metabolism at a cellular level. All of those are going to give you clues as to what you do next, right, to help stabilize this patient. Because what do we want to do? Get them back to homeostasis. Again, air management one. There are some patient indicators, like maybe the pattern is normal, but the patient can't really speak very well. Now, this is not, what we're talking about here is not something in terms of slurred speech like a stroke. What we're talking about here is the patient is using very little words, right? They're, they're answering things quickly. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, no. Uh, and they're, they're breathing as they're doing this. They're trying to breathe. This is definitely telling you that they're they have issues with residual volume. What's residual volume? Residual volume from airway management one, you should know is the air that's left in the system after you exhale. So if you don't exhale everything and you keep more than you really should be keeping in your lungs, there's always gonna be some residual volume, but if you keep too much residual volume, what's happening chemically? You should know this, right? Well, what do you expel? Carbon dioxide. If you're leaving carbon dioxide in the system, isn't that gonna mess up our entire oxygenation and respiration cycle? We've got too much oxygen. Patient's now getting, oh, sorry, too much carbon dioxide. Patient has too much carbon dioxide in their system. That's going to cause some problems in, in the entire VOG, or VOR rather, process. And you should know what VOR is now. Right? <clears throat> if we have people with too slow or too fast a respiratory rate, we could have tidal volume issues. They're either getting not enough oxygen or they're breathing and, oh, basically they're not getting enough oxygen, right? But their tidal volume is off. <clears throat> 
All of these are ventilation problems, and we know that when we have ventilation problems, we're going to have oxygenation and respiration issues just a matter of time. So we got to correct this before they become major issues, because if we get into those situations where we allow this to deteriorate, we end up with oxygenation and respiration issues, then at some point, this patient is going to be needing CPR. We're trying to stop that from happening. Okay, so you're back to being squad 51. The scene is safe and your environment is uh, assessment doesn't give you anything that's noteworthy. You're, you're across from this sausage factory. The patient is a 36-year-old male. They're standing in a tripod position. As you speak with them, you note that they answer questions, but using only minimal words, little words. Their respiratory rate is about 10, but very labored, meaning it's hard for them to breathe. What does this tell you about their volumes? What volume is affected, right? What's happening under the covers with ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration? What type of assistance should you provide and what you should be worried about, right? What should you be worried? What's going to deteriorate here if you don't take oxygen? All right, I'll let you figure that out. So let's continue with patient assessment. We talked about this inad inadequate breathing, inappropriate breathing. What are some of the signs? How do we apply this to actually do an assessment? Well, we want to do an assessment of respiration. Even, the patient, even though the patient may be ventilating, right, we need to understand their level of consciousness and their skin color. Because these things are going to tell us, hopefully, how well they're getting oxygen into the system and doing cellular exchange, gas exchange. And all of those things, right, obviously kick off the rest of the processes in the body that we need to keep <clears throat> working well. So level of consciousness, really important to ascertain and skin color. Now skin color we'll talk about in a moment, but let's go into the level of consciousness a little bit. We need to get a baseline for that patient, so we need to make sure that what we're seeing isn't there normal. You could be speaking to a patient that maybe is a little slower or not so fast on being able to answer questions. That's just who they are. So you need to hopefully find out is this normal for this patient or not, right? Now obviously if they don't know where they are, they have no clue, you know, and I've had that situation where somebody doesn't know. They don't even know their home address. Doesn't mean that their level of consciousness is off. It's just they may have, you know, never realized that they may have some other disability, mental disability. So you got to figure out that baseline. Um, <clears throat> now, if they do have a true um, issue with level of consciousness, right? If they really, you've ascertained their, their, their consciousness, their level of consciousness is off. You need to figure out what part of their anatomy is causing this problem, right? So what controls the entire ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration process? It's your brain. So what we need to be concerned about is, is there something impacting their brain, right? Is it impacting the ability for these, you know, is the brain becoming compromised? Are we having an issue with, with what's going on there? Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. We're going to get their level of consciousness, and the reason is because we need to understand, you know, what part of the anatomy has been impacted. Now, skin color, sometimes it can help with a lot of things, but if you have pale skin, which is also known as pallor, and that will probably be on your test, you know, what, what is pallor, pale skin? Uh, it's typically associated with poor perfusion. You should know perfusion from our last video, and that usually means there's some type of illness or shock occurring in the system, right? So you could have somebody who's pale, because they have a cold, they have the flu, they have pneumonia, right? So we need to understand, okay, you know, why this is happening. But in any case, there is an impact to perfusion. It just has the impact to perfusion um, caused us a concern of respiratory distress or a respiratory issue. That is now a problem. Um, cyanosis means that respiratory issue, that perfusion issue, perfusion has gotten worse, right? If we have pale skin, We've got the early indicator of perfusion being not good. And if we get to cyanosis, blue or purple discoloring of the skin typically starts in the extremities but can begin moving up the limbs. You and could go into the lips and, and the toes and things like that. If we're at that point, we now have a much more serious perfusion issue. If this continues, we're eventually going to have an issue with um, metabolism again. Right, and the cell means we're at the cell level, and at that point, the body's trying to figure out what to do. It's basically starting to refocus where circulation is occurring, and 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 trying to focus on helping the more important organs in the body. We've got a pretty serious situation at this point. We've got to reverse and help perfusion, and that's going to typically be done through oxygen therapy. So hopefully, this makes sense to you. Again, you need to follow up by studying the text. <clears throat> 
So how do we figure out the level of oxygen in the blood? <clears throat> we use something called pulse oximetry. So when you <clears throat> pulse oximetry is simply a device that you attach to a patient, typically their fingers, but it can also be attached to their earlobe and, and it depends what's going on, but usually you're going to use their finger. Now for pulse oximetry to work, the device has to be able to find some type of pulse. Now you have pulses throughout your body. As EMTs, we typically think of carotid and brachial and radial ulna and, and femoral and the list goes on and on. But you do have <clears throat> pulses occurring through other parts of the body and a pulse oximetry when you attach it to a finger is looking for a pulse. So if they can't find one, uh, it's not going to give you a reading, or at least not an accurate reading. Um, but chances are, in, if you have a good pulse oximetry device, it's just not going to work. And that could in itself be a sign that even if you put it on different fingers, you're not able to get an oximetry reading. And at this point, you probably have a condition that's deteriorating in this patient, assuming the pulse oximetry device is pretty good. So what pulse oximetry is actually measuring, and this is really important for you to know, is the percentage of hemoglobin molecules that are found in arterial blood. Okay, so it's important for you to understand it's looking at how many hemoglobin molecule, molecules there are and how saturated those molecules, those hemoglobin molecules are. Now, it doesn't really know if the hemoglobin molecules have been bonded or uh, connected to either oxygen or carbon monoxide molecules. And we covered a little bit about this in Airway Management 1, but the important thing here to know is that if you have an environment where there's potential carbon monoxide been released or some other medical conditions with this patient, um, you're going to get a false reading. So again, we go back to what's the environment being telling us? What do we see at the scene? Um, but let's say you don't have that. You have a <clears throat> good environment, clean environment. At that point, pulse oximetry is going to measure the percentage of hemoglobin saturation, again, you need to know this for your test. And if you don't understand this, go back to airman management one. Um, room, if, you re, if somebody's breathing in a normal room, they're at least going to be at 94% oxygenation. That's how much air. So if they're not getting 94, 95%, then you know there's something going on in their system, right? And they're having some other kind of issue. Um, so typically, anytime it's less than 94, you need to get oxygen in that person, okay? And help bring those numbers up. Now, really important thing is pulse oximeters have a minute delay. What I mean by that is it's a full minute from what number you see. So if you see 96%, 97%, 98% uh, saturation rate, it's a full minute from when that occurred. <clears throat> so let's think about this. You could be in front of a patient getting their pulse ox. You see 98%. But that, pul that pulse ox is from a minute ago. So is it possible that that patient could be deteriorating even though you think you have a good pulse ox? So you look down, you go right on your paper, you update your chart. You're like, yeah, their pulse rate's good. Or sorry, their pulse ox is good. And suddenly that patient's eyes roll back and they, they become unresponsive. Yeah. So pulse ox, just keep in mind, uh, is a good indicator of where the pulse ox, uh, the overall uh, percentage of uh, hemoglobin molecules are in the blood, which is a good indicator of what our oxygen saturation levels are, but um, we're dealing with dated information. So you need to keep an eye on that patient. Okay, um, good, let's keep going. The last thing here that we need to think about is end tidal CO2. It sounds crazy. You could bring this up in a, <clears throat> in a bar somewhere and you'll sound like you're a rocket scientist. But all this is is how much carbon dioxide comes out of somebody's mouth or nose, nasal or oral cavities. That's it, right? So when somebody breathes out, um, we want to know how, what is the measure of CO2. And typically the normal measure is going to be 35 to 45 millimeters hydrogen. So just think 35 to 45 is a good end tidal CO2, okay? And end tidal CO2 is just the carbon dioxide that's this exhaled out of the person's nasal or oral cavities. If somebody has a low reading below 35, they're either hyperventilating, right? <clears throat> um, there's reduced CO2 production at the cellular level, right? So we now have, you know, an issue with there's not enough CO2 in the system. Something's going on. If they have a high CO2 carbon dioxide level, then there's some kind of ventilation isn't being done adequately. They're having an issue with ventilation. 
okay um and then apnea right could could potentially be one of the issues uh, typically to do this you need specialized devices right so it's not as easy as the pulse ox um, you need to check with your instructors and your textbook to get either examples of this or determine if it's something being used in your state um, so we're not going to go much deeper into this you can read or learn to read um, the cap uh, cap capnometry and the capconometry devices output there's waveforms a lot of them just give you a digital indicator they just show you on a screen here's the the uh, the uh, level of uh, end tidal co2 and those are really easy but go check with your instructors and check with um, your state to see what the appropriate protocols are so let's talk about airway management devices, right? These are the actual tools that we're going to employ. We're going to go through this real quick. You probably have seen demos on this. You probably can get this out of your textbooks, but just wanted to highlight some things you may see in an exam and you kind of need to know if you're at a party with a bunch of other EMTs and they're all talking weird, geeky stuff. Uh, so suctioning, big thing, never suction the mouth and the nose for more than 15 seconds for an adult, 10 seconds for a child, five seconds for infant. So let's just think about it. Into adult, child, infant. 15, 10, 5. 5, 10, 15. Start with the baby, start with the adult. 5 at the baby, infant. 15 at the adult. In between that is what? 10. 15, 10, 5. 5, 10, 15. You can create hypoxia in a patient if you suction too long. And we should know at this point that hypoxia is a real serious issue related to oxygen at the cell level. Okay, so you've got to be careful. You don't become the reason for um, <clears throat> hypoxia, okay? When patients have secretions or vomitus that can't be suctioned, this could be a test question. What if you can't? What if suction doesn't work? What if you tried suctioning and you're not getting those fluids and, and materials out of the patient's airway? Remove the catheter, log roll the patient as a unit to their side, hopefully with help, and then clear the mouth with a gloved finger. Now, you're never, ever, ever going to try to go deeper into somebody's airway um, <clears throat> than, than the edge of the aeropharynx. Right? You don't want to stick your hand way down somebody's throat, bottom line, okay? You want to kind of get the oral cavity, get that cleaned out, and then return to suctioning, right? See if you can get them back on their back and continue your suctioning. And you may need to go back and forth until you get that person. If you're doing CPR, be very careful about how you do this. You know, <clears throat> you need to continue compressions. So even if you're going to try and suction, you're going to try and log roll to clear. Um, compressions have to continue. You got about 10 seconds to do that, so you can't lollygaggle around. If you see frothy secretions, right, kind of looks like a Slurpee from a fast food place coming out of somebody's mouth, um, you're going to suction for 15 seconds if they're an adult. 10 if they're a child, 5 if they're a kid. Point is, don't panic, don't freak. Then you're going to ventilate for two minutes. And you're going to continue this pattern uh, until you've cleared all the secretions. Now, obviously, if you're doing CPR again, you can't just not do compressions, right? So you, you need to keep in mind that CPR trumps compressions, trump your, you, you got to follow that protocol, basically, is what I'm saying, okay? Um, but we also have to ventilate. So you're going to need to work out your protocol. Basic airway adjuncts. <clears throat> so the reason we use uh, basic airway is to prevent obstruction of the tongue. That's the most important thing. We are not doing advanced in, uh, airway management, right? We're not sticking a tube down somebody's, uh, into somebody's trachea. We're basically trying to put something against the tongue uh, or clear the tongue, push the tongue down so that we can facilitate better ventilation, which leads to better oxygenation and ultimately or hopefully respiration. So the oropharyngeal airway, or what is abbreviated OPA, is gonna keep the tongue from blocking the upper airway, and you should know the structure of the upper airway. And it makes it easier to suction, right, the oropharynx, and you should know what the oropharynx is and where it's located. You can only use this in somebody who's unresponsive without a gag reflex, so they're probably gonna be unconscious right? But they can't have a gag reflex. If you use this with somebody who's got a gag reflex, meaning they're probably conscious, and you're going to <clears throat> probably get them to vomit. Keep in mind that um, somebody can be unconscious and responsive, right? 
you can have somebody who's unconscious and you rub their sternum or do something else, pinch them, and they respond to stimuli. So you have to think about what we mean by unresponsive as there's no response to some form uh, of, of stimulus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in a penic patient who's being ventilated with a bag mass device, meaning they're, they're, they don't have ventilation, you can use this, but they're, they're, they're also going to probably be unconscious and unresponsive. You don't use this in conscious patients and anybody with a gag reflex. So remember one or the other, and then you can use it for the opposite or not use it for the opposite. <clears throat> Nasopharyngeals or NPA are going to be used in a patient who is conscious, right? Um, they may be unresponsive. As I mentioned before, you can have unconscious and, and responsive. Um, sorry, not responsive. Um, but ultimately, the bottom line here is they have a gag reflex, uh, and they can't maintain their own airway, right? Their, their tongue keeps slipping back. Um, maybe they're drunk or something else is going on, uh, and you can't keep that gag reflex, right? So if you basically, here's the kill. If you can't use an oropharyngeal airway, you can evaluate should you use a nasopharyngeal airway. And the only reason you want to use that is if the person can't maintain their airway on their own. Easiest way to think about it. So semi-conscious or unconscious patients with an intact gag reflex, patients who will not tolerate an oropharyngeal airway, meaning you have somebody that for some reason, which I'm not too sure if they can't tolerate it, it could be trauma, it could be uh, oral cavity trauma, something of the nature, right? They can't tolerate is what we mean. doesn't mean they're telling you I don't want that. If they can tell you I don't want that, they're conscious and responsive. So you're going to use a nasopharyngeal airway anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we've kind of talked about this, right? You can't use this uh, if there is a severe head injury with any kind of blood and nose. If you have a bloody nose, don't use the uh, nasopharyngeal airway. If they have a history of a fractured nose bone, don't use it. Now your protocols may vary in the state you're in as to how this is done, but as far as the national standards, you don't use these with bloody nose or history of a fractured nose. Okay, there you go. CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. You need to know what CPAP stands for. Continuous positive airway pressure. Continuous positive airway pressure. This is a device, a mechanism that gives you ventilatory support for respiratory distress. You have somebody who's having issues with ventilation. They're in respiratory distress. They're not able to breathe. Um, so you're giving them Basically, uh, you're forcing their ventilation process through pro positive pressure. So what happens here is you increase the pressure in the lungs, which opens any collapsed alveoli, right? And it pushes more oxygen across the alveolar membranes, right? You're going to have more oxygen molecules waiting for hemoglobin molecules, molecules to show up and take them off to the uh, systemic circulate, the systemic systems that need um the oxygen molecules. <clears throat> this also forces interstitial fluid back into the pulmonary circulation system. Um, you do this through a face mask, okay? You have to be very cautious about this because if somebody already has low blood pressure and you do CPAP, CPAP has a tendency to lower blood pressure. So if you already have somebody with a low blood pressure to begin with and you introduce CPAP, at that point, you're going to lower their pressure even more, and that's going to create a, a circulatory challenge, right, which will lead to a respiratory challenge. So you need to get their blood pressure before you begin CPAP, okay, uh, and, and then continually assess that blood pressure to make sure it hasn't fallen to a dangerous level. So you can use this when somebody is alert, they have to be able to follow your commands. You're going to have to explain to them how to do what's going to happen, what you're doing, right? What the steps are, not to panic, those type of things. If they have moderate to severe respiratory distress, right? And we talked some of that during the patient assessment segment. Um, you can, you probably should use this. Um, <clears throat> if they just had some form of near drowning or drowning experience, um, but again, they have to be alert and able to follow commands. So if somebody's drowned and they're unconscious, you can't do this. If they are conscious and they just got them out of a pool or a river or a lake and they got some water into their system um, and, <clears throat> you know, they're having respiratory distress, but they can follow your commands, you can go ahead and use this. Um, the patient's breathing rapidly. You have a rapid breath pattern. Their pulse ox um, 
is less than 90, right? So they're not saturated, their oxygen saturation levels are low, right? Which means we're eventually going to have respiratory, uh, res respiration issues. So you don't use this in a whole bunch of reasons. Respiratory arrest, they're just not breathing at all. They're hypoventilating, not breathing quickly. They can't speak, okay? They're unresponsive and can't follow commands, right? Um, they cannot protect their own airway, meaning they're having challenges to their own airway. Uh, hypotension, their blood pressure. They have any kind of a sign of pneumothorax or chest trauma. Tracheostomies, can't do that, right? Hole in the throat, the trachea. Um, they have any kind of signs of gastrointestinal bleeding. They're spitting up blood. Um, there's facial trauma. You have the structure of the oral cavity uh, or the facial uh, bones are, are not intact. So it can't create a seal for the positive pressure and you're going to cause a ton of pain. They're in some form of cardiogenic shock. Um, they cannot sit upright. The patient has to be in a, in a upright fowler, semi fowler position. They can't tolerate the mask. They freak out. Um, or they can't tolerate it because of some other trauma that they have. So <clears throat> you apply it. Um, when you apply it, it's going to create some kind of back pressure, which opens the small alveoles. And then the, as the patient exhales, um, this allows the ability for new oxygen to come in. Okay. Complications with this. Some patients are going to find this as crazy, weird, and claustrophobic. There is a risk that you could create a pneumothorax because of the pressure differentials. You could lower the patient's blood pressure, which we already talked about. And if the patient shows signs of deterioration, if you do have any of these start, any kind of deterioration, they're not getting better on the CPAP. They're getting worse. Don't see if it clears up. Get the CPAP off them and go to a bag bowel mask or some other form of positive, um, <clears throat> positive pressure ventilation. All right, let's talk about patient management. So patient management, this, the recovery position, right? You got a good graphic here, memorize that graphic, know how to put somebody in this position. Why do we do this? Help somebody maintain a clear airway if they're unconscious. Um, <clears throat> and obviously we want to make sure that they're not suffering from some other form of injury, especially spinal injuries, head trauma, something that would, putting them in this position, complicate it, right? We're not going to put somebody in a broken pelvis or uh, some form of um, damage to their knee or their femur or their arms in this position, right? This is somebody who um, is recovering, uh, is unconscious, and we don't have any other complicating um, issues. One time that you may do this is what's done, what's, uh, what you do after CPR. So you're doing CPR and the patient starts to, you start to get a pulse, right? Um, they start to breathe on their own. You don't need to assist their breathing. So you've recovered the patient after uh, they were pulseless and uh, were not, um, and they were, out, they were in cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest and you recovered them. So that's known as ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. So think about why we're doing CPR. We don't have any circulation. Compressions are trying to get circulation, do the job of the heart. And suddenly you get back circulation. How do you know you got circulation back? You got a pulse and they're breathing. The reason I'm saying and they're breathing is you could have somebody who has circulation to have a pulse, but they're not breathing. So you're going to keep breathing, but you can't put somebody in this position if you're, they're not breathing. Okay. I'm hoping that all comes together for you, but you may have a question somewhere that says, what is ROSSC? You need to know it's return of spontaneous circulation. What does that mean? They've gotten a pulse back. They're circulating again on their own. Um, and so what can you do for them if their circulation's back and they're breathing? We can put them in the recovery position because there's a chance that they may, they may vomit. <clears throat> they may need to drain fluids, things of that nature. But you need to continue monitoring the patient, right? So make sure that anytime you describe putting somebody into a recovery position, you add that you need to continue monitoring this patient's ventil ventilation, oxygenation and circulation, right? You're going to continue to support their airway breathing and circulation, their ABCs, okay? Oxygen. We're going to always give oxygen to somebody's hypoxic, hopefully before they become hypoxic. Um, so just something to know. It's going to be something that comes up. You need to understand. We give oxygen to patients who are hypoxic or prior to becoming hypoxic, which would be hypo, uh, hypoxemia, okay? Okay. 
You don't withhold oxygen from any patient who can benefit from it. Now the concern becomes oxygen toxicity. What if I give too much oxygen? We're usually going to give too much of a high concentration of oxygen. So you can lower the concentration, hopefully, by reducing the flow of uh, the, the liters per minute. Um, <clears throat> if you have something with somebody with CVOPD, um, then you may need to think about how you're going to deliver oxygen to them because you could trip you could cause a challenge for that COPD patient. Now, again, in airway management one, we talked about COPD. So one way to think about how do you deal and monitor oxygen toxicity is you want to try to maintain their pulse ox at about 94. If you see it going up too high, you can back down the oxygen delivery. If you see it dropping below 94, bring it back up, right? So 94, 95, somewhere around there. The point of this is monitor. If you get this question, you're going to monitor pulse ox levels uh, in order to determine if the patient's being adequately uh, oxygenated, okay? But you're going to, ultimately, the answer is always going to be give oxygen and then monitor oxygen saturation to assure that you have appropriate oxygen levels. So what do we use to deliver oxygen? We have non-rebether masks. Um, this is the preferred way. We've got nasal cannulas. Um, this is for patients that aren't having very severe respiratory problems. So if you have somebody who's kind of maybe a little bit out of breath, maybe having a little trouble breathing, you can get them on a cannula. Somebody who has trauma, right, they've, they've lost blood, maybe they have some chest pains going on, um, you know, but you don't have other symptoms of cardiac distress. Um, but you basically want to use the nasal cannula as, an ad, as, a, as a mild adjunct, a helper. Right. Uh, if somebody has issues with their mouth, you can go to a nasal cannula. Um, <clears throat> if you're trans somebody, transporting somebody a, a, a large distance, you know, 30, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, uh, you need to humidify the oxygen. All oxygen is typically dry, so we add some water to it through humidification. And um, again, this is a skill you'll learn in the class, but just keep that in mind for test. Non-rebether masks um, are when we have much more serious issues. And what we're trying to do is fill up the mask, the, the bag, uh, so that we can increase the amount of oxygen, right? So we just talked about oxygen toxicity, uh, and we're gonna, we'll come back to that in a moment. But non-rebethers, basically we have a much more serious situation. Patient doesn't need actual ventilation. They're not at the point where we have to use a bag bag, bag valve mask, but they do need much higher levels of oxygen. We've got to get that pulse ox up. And we got to try and reverse the uh, hypoxia or hypoxemia um, and, and try to get that patient stable. Okay, so that's why we're going to use non rebreathing masks. So pictures of each one here on the left-hand side. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side, I gave you a little table that you need to know. So the progression of this is this. The lowest level of oxygen is going to be delivered through a nasal cannula at about 24 to 44%. Okay, they run about 1 to, point, 1 to 6 liters per minute. That's the lowest. If your patient's not doing well on a nasal cannula or wouldn't benefit from a lower level of oxygen, then you're going to get them on a non-rebreather. That's running at about 10 to 15 liters per minute and about 90% oxygenation. Okay? And then the last one is going to be your bag valve mask. And that's going to be running at 15 liters per minute at about 100% oxygen. Now here's something. So you need to think about what's happening with your patient, right? You're not just going to slap one of these on and do the wrong thing for them. Now, I want you to look at the photos. On the top left, we have a <clears throat> non-rebreather, and then we have a cannula, and then we have a bad valve mask. This bad valve mask, is this running at nearly 100%? Probably not. Why? Because we don't have oxygen connected to this one. So keep that in mind, right? If you want to get to that 100%, you got to there's a port on this and you're going to connect O2 to it and that's going to increase the oxygenation level and you're going to assist ventilations and those things together will get you at about 100%. But this is the progression. You need to know the progression so that when you're assessing a patient, if you're seeing a scene, if you're at a scene, you can choose which is the right um, tool to use and you're not going to over oxygenate this patient, right? So we have somebody with COPD maybe we want to just start out with a nasal cannula. We're just trying to assist what they're doing. We don't want to create a, a higher concentration of oxygen than we need to. Um, if they're responding well to the nasal cannula, great, right? <clears throat> just so you know, oxygen toxicity takes a very long time. So you're better off giving somebody oxygen than not giving them oxygen. So you have a 26-year-old <clears throat> female patient. She just has completed running a marathon. 
She was short of breath before you got on scene. The environment's good. There's nothing remarkable in the environment. When you speak to her, she's able to speak well, but she's still sweating. Color appears to be normal. Um, her current respirations are 16. Pulse ox is 95. So pulse ox is a little low. Her respirations are a little high. Um, you know, we don't have currently any obvious signs of um, shortness of breath. So as a precaution, what can you describe? What can you decide to do? What would you do if you decided, you know what, just to be safe, I'm going to give her a little bit of oxygen. What tool would you use? Okay. Now after she sits down, you take another pulse ox and it drop. You see it's dropped to 93. Now, how delayed is the pulse ox? Right? I told you this earlier. How much time goes by between when you see the pulse ox and the actual pulse ox that occur? It's measuring how long ago in time. So it's 93 right now. It was 95 just a minute or two ago. So it could be even lower at this point, correct? So what do you want to do to, to hopefully increase her oxygen levels? You've, you've already given her something, but that seems to be working. You gave it to her as a precaution. What's the next tool you would give her, assuming she's continuing to breathe on her own, to help drive up that oxygenation level? All right, I'll let you guys figure that out. Partial rebreather masks, these are similar to non-rebreathers. There's just a one-way valve between the mask and the reservoir. Um, the, the point of this one is these actually, when the patient breathes out, when they have this partial rebreather mask on them, they're going to rebreathe some of their own exhaled air, okay? So why would you want somebody to breathe back in some of their exhaled air? Well, what's in that exhaled air? What's in that? Well, you should know that from airway management one right? Carbon dioxide. So if we're trying to get the patient to breathe in carbon dioxide, what is going on in their body that we're trying to put carbon dioxide back in? Okay. So what would you suspect is occurring from ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration? Okay. And what is this condition called? Right. <clears throat> All right. Um, gastric distension. This is going to probably come up. Um, so when you are doing ventilations, there's a chance you could cause gastric distension. This typically occurs because you put too much emphasis on a bag bag mask and the air is going in the esophagus and into the, to the stomach, uh, into the abdominal cavity rather, sorry. And this causes the abdominal cavity to distend, right? So <clears throat> first thing, slow down, stop ventilating so forcefully and so quickly. Um, this can also happen if the airway is obstructed, right? So air comes back out of the lungs. It can't get out the or air oral nasal cavity to the world. So it hits whatever the obstruction is, and it goes back down into the esophagus. So this is a gastric distension. Could be a sign that you have an airway obstruction, right? Um, so if you're doing CPR and you haven't started um, <clears throat> ventilating at this point because you're in the middle of your compression cycle, you see gastric distension, you may want to be thinking about, especially if this is your first pass through it, uh, that you have an airway obstruction in this patient. This you found just came up on somebody that's um, on the ground, unconscious, no pulse, not breathing. Uh, you start CPR and you notice immediately they have a gastric distension going on. So we've talked about how do you do this. Make sure that the airway is appropriately um, um, positioned, you have an appropriate airway, that you're ventilating at a good, calm rate uh, and with the appropriate volume, right? You just want to give them enough of a squeeze on that bag that just rises the chest. You don't need to blow the chest out of the water, right? Think about how high your chest rises when you take normal breaths. It's not a lot. So you want to kind of make sure you can see the chest rise from your ventilation, but you don't need to kill it because any air that comes back out is going to go back down that esophagus, or you may you may force air down the esophagus. <clears throat> um, if you see you're creating gastric distension, reposition their head and 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 think about maybe moving to some other form of ventilation, um, mouth to to uh, mask or something like that, because uh, the ventilation is way too much. You should also be prepared for the patient to uh, to to vomit. Uh, so you may need to take steps to clear their airway uh, and get their, get their airway clear. <clears throat> Big thing here that I want you to take away, uh, airway obstructions, right? They're blocking the airway. 
Um, this can occur at any time. A child, it's most likely going to be an airway obstruction if you're called and the child was playing around and joking and totally okay. There was no precursor to the situation you were called to. Probably, and if they're unconscious when you arrive, probably the first thing you want to do is check for airway obstruction. Um, <clears throat> you can have airway obstruction without having something in the airway that's a foreign body. You can have swelling from some type of uh, infection or uh, acute allergic reaction to, to whatever. It could be food, medication, the environment. Uh, and then obviously tissue. You could, tissue. You could collapse the airway. You can cause uh, oral nasal cavity trauma that blocks the airway, doesn't allow somebody to breathe. You could cause somebody to bite down on their tongue and uh, swallow part of their tongue. So those type of things can cause airway obstruction. So things that you need to know for your exam. Um, <clears throat> mild airway obstructions, patients are still exchanging air. They're probably going to be in respiratory distress. You're going to hear breathing, wheezing, coughing. They're coughing. That's a big one. Is the patient's coughing? Do you? What do you do? If they're having good air exchange, right, you're not seeing them change colors. They're trying to work this out on their own. Uh, they can speak. Um, don't interfere with them, right? Let them try to see if they can naturally exhale, uh, expel whatever the object is. Um, if they start turning colors, you know, if they're having issues, strider, you're starting to see marked uh, challenges on their necks. Their muscles are starting, they're trying to really use their muscles on the side of their neck or their clavicles. They're really using a lot of accessory muscles. Then you need to step in, okay? At the moment you see that they're changing colors and they're really not able to, to, to breathe or cough, you're going from mild to severe airway obstruction and you need to start getting involved. <clears throat> this here I'm going to leave. You can find more about this on your in your textbook. Mostly I just want you to know that there's probably going to be some questions about how do you support paramedics with advanced intubation. Uh, again, you may want to check with your instructors how important this is to know. Different um, jurisdictions will have different rules about who gets involved with the paramedics when they're doing advanced intubation and what protocols to follow. But it could be a part of the national standard because the textbooks have this. So keep this in mind. I'm not going to go much deeper into it. Just want you to know it's there. So that is the end of section two. Hopefully between this and airway management one, you've got a really good foundation and the things that you get brought up in class, the things you read in your books, flashcards, whatever you're doing um, are going to make it a lot easier for you now um, to get past this module. But more importantly, that when you hit the streets, you're going to have a really good foundation of why things are happening uh, and then be able to determine what is the most effective approaches and not allow your patient to deteriorate as best you can. Um, so with that, truly appreciate um, your feedback. Um, if you like it, hit the like button. And if you want to see more like this, then hey, subscribe. We'll be coming out with, with more of these as time goes on. Take care.